So the class is about biotechnology and environmentalism. The purpose of this village is to give an example of alternatives to the unsustainable, exploitative ways that human society is reciprocating with the gifts of Mother Earth and nature. A year and a half ago, I was in a conference in Beverly Hills. It was at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. It was called the Mike Milken Global Conference. Have any of you heard about that? And there were leaders of politics, science, medicine, entertainment from all over the world. $5,000 $5,000 a ticket for three days. But because I was a speaker, I didn't have to pay anything. <laughs> but I was giving morning meditations. But there was about 4,000 participants. That was the ceiling. And... They're very much into leadership on various levels. And in one, I went to one seminar, which was quite amazing, actually. There was 2,000 people there, and it was a panel. And during the panel, the one thing they brought up was that according to medical research, the human beings who are on the planet today, half of all males will have some sort of cancer in their life, and one third of all females. It's never been like that before. So we've made so much progress in, in those little telephones that everyone carries around and making computers smaller and faster and in getting more efficient satellites to send hundreds of stations of television shows to any part of the world. And a tremendous amount of money in medical technology rocket ships going to other planets. A lot of progress. But is the quality of life improving? We cure some diseases. You know, we've very nicely, to a large extent, cured smallpox, influenza, and other, you know, diseases that were major causes of death. cancer, heart disease. One of the three most prominent diseases that is going to cause suffering and death in this century, according to the World Health Organization, is depression. Because of stress, because of lack of inner fulfillment. You know, Hollywood is progressing every year with special effects. But are people happier? Maybe, you know, they forget their sorrows while they're watching the special effects. (laughs) But then they have to face their life again. And diseases like we were just speaking, much of it is due to environmental poisons and just a very, very stressful, unsatisfying life. And 
and politicians, some are brave enough to discuss it. Others are either in denial because they just don't know what to do, or they know what the problem is, but they don't want to talk about it because they know what they want to, they have to do, but they know the consequences of trying to do it. There's a golden rule of environmentalism that what you take from Mother Earth, we should give back. And what we give back is what eventually we're going to get. So we're taking so many gifts, foods and grains and cloths for wearing our clothes and everything we have is on the physical level are gifts of Mother Earth. But we're giving back poisons. Poison, poisons and putting materials in her that that will just remain for centuries. Polluting the waters, polluting the air, polluting the ground. So now we're getting all sorts of poisons back. And the population's growing. And if the population keeps you exploiting Mother Earth the way we do, what can our future be? So we're all, some of us are just little people. And sometimes little people think, what can I do about it? I might as well just conform to the way things are and go with the flow. Because after all, even if what difference could little people like us make? But little people like us have changed the world again and again. There's a house just about when there's no traffic 10 minutes from our ashram in Mumbai. And in that house, it's one of our friends. It's an old house. His grandfather, he would call people in his living room to discuss something that was quite extraordinary. There would only be about six or seven of them. Just kind of common people. They would meet in that living room to discuss getting the British out of India. The British was the most powerful empire in the world. And India was the crown jewel of the British Empire. They wouldn't give up this place for anything. The maximum amount of their natural resources that they were bringing to England were coming from India. And Mahatma Gandhi, as the little skinny guy who just came from South Africa, and a few of his friends, like Balabai Patel, something, they just met in that room. We're going to do it. We're going to get the British out of India. And look what happened. It began with just a few people who didn't think, you know, that in the British had the army, they had control of the armies, they had control of the government, they had control of the economy, they had the control over everything. But they wanted to make a difference. And from the opposite perspective, I was just in Munich, Germany, giving a conference. In a conference, I was invited to speak. And I saw this, this one little area where there were some buildings, and they told me that's where the Nazi party began in Munich. 
there were just a few of them, Hitler and a couple others, and they were just discussing how they're gonna how they're gonna take over. And they ran for an election and they miserably lost. Miserably lost. They came in last place, I think. But you know, we're gonna do it. <laughs> And then certain things changed in the economy and everything. And then the next time, you know, they just got more and more support and they won. So, of course, you know, it's a very different thing than Gandhi. But it does show that just a few people could actually make a huge difference in this world. You know, in my own spiritual culture, the Krishna consciousness movement, this one 70 year old man, Srila Prabhupada, our guru, he left Brindavan, he had no money. Nobody in India wanted to help him because they all thought it was absolutely impossible to spread this, this Sanatan Dharma message of bhakti outside of India. They said impossible. Even people in a, of his god brothers and god sisters, his own people, would not help him in any way. As they said, it's useless. And he got off a cargo ship after 38 days on the sea. He was living in the Bowery, a ghetto of New York. And everybody in India he knew were just telling, just come back, forget it. Seven-year-old man with no money, didn't know a person. And by the time he left the world, there were millions of people who were his followers. 300 temples, ashrams, the largest in the history of the world, the largest distribution of Vedic literatures is one person who just wanted to do what he could. There's a story that he told us that a little sparrow was on the shore of the ocean and she laid her eggs. Those were her babies. This, the tide rose and the ocean took all the eggs. It's an allegorical story. So little sparrows told the ocean that give my eggs back. But the ocean, why should the ocean pay attention to a sparrow? So the sparrow said, if you don't give my eggs back, I'm going to dry you up with my beak. And she went in and she picked up a drop of water with her beak as much as it would hold. And then she flew a distance and put it somewhere else. And then she went back and took some more water with her beak and flew somewhere else and dropped it. And just kept doing that. And she was determined to dry up the ocean. How long would it take a sparrow with a beak this big to dry up the ocean? Because every rainstorm that goes into the ocean is mil billions of times more than what she could pick up in her life. <laughs> <clears throat> but seeing her endeavor, the higher power of God Garuda is an aspect of God who's like a bird, came down and said to the ocean, if you don't give the eggs back, I will dry you up. So the ocean gave the eggs back. <laughs> and the mother sparrow and her children lived happily ever after. So the concept of this story is how small we are there's higher powers beyond ourselves. If we become instruments of those higher powers, we actually really can make a difference. Even one person. What to speak if we network with other people of, of like minds. So considering the situation of the world, and from our perspective, the environmental problem, it's not an environmental problem. It's a spiritual problem. People have a, have a, are disconnected from themselves. 
disconnected from the grace that's, that's descending all around them. It's a spiritual problem to have greed. It's a spiritual problem to have this arrogance that we could just do whatever we want and we're not answerable to nature and to God. It's a spiritual problem when we're not living our lives as an expression of the deep compassion and love we found within ourselves. And rather, we just have this unquenchable needs. Gandhi said, the entire world and all of its resources are not enough to satisfy the greed of one person. What to speak of when there's billions of people with greed? <laughs> what are the resources? So inner fulfillment, inner peace, inner love, that's what spirituality is about, you know, finding that and to be building our ethics on that basis. So on this is where we're coming from. From our devotion to Krishna we believe is there's one God for all living beings and Krishna is the name of God, the all attractive one that we especially are connecting with. But it's a universal principle. So the environmental situation of the world really appears extremely hopeless. The greenhouse effect, the breaking of the ozone, the pollutions, the melting of the solar ice caps. There's, there's, nobody knows what to do about it. But we do know what to do about it. Just change our consciousness and everything else will change. So this little eco-village is an attempt to just show, in our own little ways, alternatives. Sewage is a big problem in the world. Because whether you're male or female, or black or white, or red or yellow, or whether you're rich or poor, or whether you're um, educated or uneducated, there's certain things we all have in common. <laughs> And that's one of them. <laughs> Whether we're vegetarians or non-vegetarians or whatever else, vegans or lacto-ovo vegetarians, or still, when it comes out the other side, it's kind of similar. <laughs> so... <clears throat> to do with sewage. It could really pollute, it could really spread disease. So you'll see later, we have a very environmentally friendly sewage plant. If you ever come back here, and because now there's a group from all over the world actually that's taking every one of our rooms. We have these nice guest rooms. If you come back, or even if you use the toilet here, you know, just during the day, you should know every time you flush the toilet, the papayas are getting bigger and sweeter. <laughs> <laughs> and you are contributing. <laughs> and so many, and bananas are growing, and so many things are growing because of your flushing the toilet. So every drop is going, going through, you know, a natural system of just roots and herbs and rocks, and it comes out the other side, transparent, clean water. So instead of polluting, we're actually making sewage a resource. They could do that in cities. They could do that everywhere. It's just a matter of applying 
our priority is there. If we use the same energy to develop automobiles that are environmentally friendly as we do just to develop them the way they are now, we could do it. It's just a matter of shifting our priorities, our awareness. Much of the cancer and stress is due to the food we eat. You know, it's not that technology and science is necessarily bad. Did you ever read the book Frankenstein? How many have read it? He was actually a nice man, Dr. Frankenstein, and he really wanted to do good for the world. He actually wanted to solve the problem of death. He wanted to make it so if you die, you could come back to life. Yes, that's a kind of what a lot of people would like to do that. <laughs> so he had noble motives and he wanted to make a positive difference, but there was a problem and he said it himself. It's there in the book. It's actually a very educational book. It's not just a horror story where he said he was meddling with the powers of nature that he should not meddle with. Because in the name of doing something wonderful, he created a monster. And the monster turned against him and terrorized his life and terrorized everyone around. So that's kind of what we've done, humanity. In the name of doing good things, we meddle with nature in ways that we create monsters that are coming back against us and haunting us. But there's alternatives. Chemical pesticides, chemical fertilizers are basically making almost all the food we eat which is the word carcinogenic. Did I say it right? Something like that, but it makes cancer. <laughs> yes. So, <clears throat> and it's also destroying the topsoil of so many places. But we could grow food with natural fertilizers and natural pesticides and actually nourish the topsoil rather than destroy the topsoil and bring about real nutrients that give health rather than give some vitamins but give all sorts of, of, of dangerous chemicals at the same time. According to some politicians and sociologists, they say that in the future there will be wars over water. There's been wars over coal. And then a little later there was war, there's wars over oil. There will be wars over water if we don't do something about it. There's no reason. Water harvesting is something anyone could do anywhere. There's this, this group of yoga people asked a question yesterday um, that when we were coming here, we saw the many of the villages looked so dry and gray and brown. We came here and there's so much greenery. It's not because money was put here. That doesn't create greenery. It's because we just focused our energy in preserving the water that falls from the sky. Because <laughs> in this area of the world, it only rains three to four months a year, and then there's not a drop of rain the rest of the year. But during that three or four months, you could save enough water to have a lush green area and have plenty of water for bathing and cooking for the rest of the year if you just learn how to harvest the water. Why 
I just let it go down. Whatever falls on your roof could go into an underground tank and serve that building for the rest of the year. The government has, we just won an award, a national award for water, for water harvesting. I think it's 10 million liters. There's a um, pond that we created here that basically stores the water. So these are all just natural things and taking care of cows and taking care of other animals. We believe in ahimsa, that life is sacred and that no one has a right to create unnecessary pain or death to any other living being. And humans being the so-called most in evolved species of life, our superiority in certain abilities of intelligence and technology and creativity and free will doesn't give us right to exploit the lesser species. It gives us the responsibility to protect them. And if we don't protect them, we won't protect each other either. If we can't honor and respect the animals, we probably won't be able to respect other humans that are different than us either. So we believe in this. So we have beautiful cow. Have you been there yet? They're waiting for you. <laughs> A wonderful cow is in their calves. And we just, they're our family. We love them. And most of the people here drink milk, but it's not vegan. Although we will serve vegan foods for people who aren't. But the idea is when milk is coming from cows that are loved and protected from the day they're born to the day of their natural death, then that's a beautiful thing. It's not based on, it's not that we're supporting you know, killing and, and exploitation. We believe that's a sacred principle of humanity. It's a way of honoring Mother Earth and her children. And we also have some donkeys and sheep and goats and dogs. Why? Because we believe in the sanctity of life, not just to cast consciousness, only cows. <laughs> you'll find in the building materials of all these buildings on this side of the farm. Um, it's as eco-friendly as we were able to research that we could do. We found after a year of research, one lady and her husband, her name is Chitra Vishwanath from South India, and her whole life is in eco-friendly building. And all these bricks are made from the earth of our own land. It's with minimal amount of other things mixed in it, natural things. And there, you may have a chance to make the bricks yourself. And then you just put, you put the mixture of the dirt and a little lime and some other things in, in a little mold and then you press it down with this natural machine it goes and it comes out a brick you put it in the sun and it sits in the sun for a few days and then you can use it so it doesn't need all the energy of rather other brooks of firing them with fires and this is a very traditional method these bricks, if they're taken care of properly, actually last longer than the other kind of bricks. So we just, an example, we can have beautiful building with sensitivity and honor toward the environment. 
So these are some of the things we're doing. We also have an Ayurvedic spa and a little Ayurvedic clinic here, natural medicine. We grow most of our own herbs for that here. So these are the concepts. Obviously, I was not prepared for this talk. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Yes. Yeah, that's what we do. We just started, but we actually have a, because we've just kind of established um, our own things within the last few years. And we're just trying to get them really to work nicely. And we do have um, people going to the local villages but that's kind of the next stage to really um, go to hundreds and hundreds of villages and share with them our ethical values, our moral values, our spiritual values, if they want to accept them, but also our philosophy of taking care of the animals. Also share with them and even do for them, you know, the digging of wells and teaching them the process of water harvesting and natural farming. We already, because they're very poor villages, many of them. From our Bombay, we feed 310,000 children a day in the ghetto schools with nutritious meals. And we have one kitchen around here. I think about 60,000 of the children in these villages in this area get free nutritious meals and food. Every day. We also set up, we have a hospital in Mumbai, Bhaktivedanta Hospital, and we set up a small little hospital just next to the village, just down the road, you passed it coming here. It's like a clinic, which does, you know, whether they can afford or not. And we're not only that, but we're educating them in hygienic and health issues because most of these people are totally uneducated. And water and crops and all those things we're trying to... That's our plan. That within the next few years, hundreds of villages will be reaching with that. And they could do it. They have all the resources they need. It's just understanding the importance and understanding how to do it. Yes. We would like to, but we don't have specific plans. Because right now this is taking our attention. But um, some of my other students are planning to start one near Pune, which is about four hours from Mumbai. So they are going to start something like that. And another student actually started one about an hour from here. It's smaller. So yes, we do, but they're not... It happens organically also, in a sense. It's not based on just a plan to do it. People get inspired, because we started this, and people just got inspired and decided, we want to do one here, and we want to do one here. So that's kind of how the plan is going. Any other question? Are my, are, is what I'm saying relevant to the subject of your class? <laughs> Honest, or you're just being gracious and polite? <laughs> yes. I was wondering what, what do you think we could take back to our school? Maybe be implemented there. Yeah. Yeah. You can take back some cow dung soap. (laughs) 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 
besides that, um, <clears throat> the values of the possibility of how we really all, each and every one of us, can make a difference. If, if we, if we have a more enlightened belief in the way we live and a faith and a hope that we could live that way and we can make a difference in the, in the world. Even if we're living in a city, you know, there are certain things that we could do to make a, to make a difference, to be an example. This is our hope that you can take back some information, some wisdom, some practical wisdom, some ideological wisdom, and a real hope that it could be done. Because this whole community was just built on that principle. Nobody wanted to do it, even among the students. Because we had we should we should demonstrate something we had an idea and we developed by by doing some research and developing some practical wisdom to to um, nourish our ideological wisdom and we just did it that's what we have here just over the last few years Let's try to be the change we want to see in the world. And for us, ecological, environmental um, respect is integral to our spiritual practice. We can talk about loving God, but if we don't honor and respect the gifts, the gifts that God is giving us through nature, then there's something lacking. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. You make me feel so encouraged. <laughs> yes. in order to turn on the lights and run we the have, equipment. We have so many different things. You'll see we have a whole solar power station. Have you seen that yet? No. How many panels are there? Yeah. 32 panels is the generation. There is one in the biogas from which we generate the steam. Cooking, and there are street lamps, small, around. What about this station right here? This engineering block. Yeah. 32 panels. Anyways, we have a lot of solar panel, and during the day, all the electricity in this entire section is powered by solar energy. And we also have um, cow dung. Not only are they good soap. <laughs> I'm impressed with the cow drums. <laughs> Thank you. But we have these, um, in that section of the community, all the, all the cooking fuel, instead of buying gas, we have this, these real simple technologies, you'll see them, I hope, where it just takes the cow dung and also takes like waste of a food that you don't use, like peels and leftovers, and it actually creates gas. And that could be made into electricity, but mostly we use it for all our cooking. It actually makes gas and goes into our stoves and fire. And, 
And we have created these environmentally friendly stoves that really um, tremendously conserve that gas. So you could cook the same thing with about one third the amount of energy just because of the way the stoves are made. And we also have the government power because in India, actually, the government subsidizes electricity so much. During, I think it was Indira Gandhi's regime, you know, she really put electricity in practically every village and really highly subsidized. That's how she won the elections. <laughs> but, um, so electricity is quite cheap and it's very much, you know, accessible. So during the nights, some of the electricity is from the stored solar power, but if, if that runs out, we, we still do use that. The reason why we're developing these alternatives is, is not so much to save money because the electricity is so cheap, but, you know, f for the world, you know, to just show from an environmental perspective, you know, these are alternatives that are more sustainable and more in the mode of goodness. Does that answer your question? village like any project you guys want are trying to do actually I only come here sometimes <laughs> <laughs> so other people could answer that better but I, I said some of them yeah. huh? he's going to explain in detail when you're on your tour <laughs> But there are many that we're trying to. Hmm? For pulling out uh, water from the earth using the bulls. Yeah, the bulls. They actually like to do it. It's fun for them. They just go around in circles and water comes out from under the ground. Cutting of the grass will be done with Instead of lawnmowers. Someone else had their hand raised? Yes. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> where, where, whatever way I could best serve, I like to serve. I'd like to stay here too. But I spend a lot of time in Mumbai. And I, I'm usually in India about seven months a year, and then I travel abroad about four to five months a year. I'm in California usually about three to four weeks a year. Yes? That's a very confidential question. <laughs> well, to be, why are you asking that question? Because uh, I read it in a book. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, what have, do you like harmonicas? <laughs> okay. Since that book came out, wherever I go, people give me gifts of harmonicas. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes I've played them, but not so much. Yes. Hmm? Especially with the hardware companies, they're making new materials. Like the initial generation, so much 
six months and everybody wants to update their cell phone or their televisions, realizing very little that the amount of waste that is being generated through these LCD screens is immense. So on one hand, we have these technology companies coming up with newer models every six months, version five, version six, and people are just rushing to buy them and even selling the kidneys to buy those cell phones. As I hear in China, people sell the kidneys to buy an iPhone. But what I'm worried is the amount of waste that is being generated and dumped. I believe it was dumped on an island in uh, somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. I'm not sure where. How, how, do we, how do we prevent people from doing that? Because the corporate world is marketing it so strongly. We don't do something about it. Nature herself will do something about it. And it's much nicer if we do something about it. <laughs> because, you know, if we don't take care of our mother when she's in a sickly condition, the reactions are going to be upon us. So awareness is important. People have to have, have to be open to a higher awareness. And usually what happens in this world is very sensitive philosophical people, they develop their awareness on the basis of values. But most people in the world, even good people, they're just so caught up that they won't really develop that awareness until there's serious consequences. I'll give a crude example, because I'm kind of crude. But when I was a boy in the 1950s, Almost every adult in America smoked cigarettes. Almost everybody. It was a fashion. And people actually thought it was good for them. Really, it was kind of promoted that way, that it kind of cleans you out. And, <laughs> and all the movie actors always had cigarettes hanging out of their mouths. And all the ladies with smoking cigarettes, there was, there was cigarettes for ladies, special ones. I don't know if it's still like that. And men, and it was just, it was considered romantic, it was considered sophisticated, it was considered prestigious, it was considered fashionable, it was considered good for your health. Yes, so everyone was just smoking. And then it just came out lung disease, cancer, heart problems, you know, and then they started putting them on the packs of cigarettes. Some places, some countries, basically there's skull and crossbones on the cigarette package and it says, this will kill you. <laughs> America does it. Kind of, they kind of say that, but in a little more, sci um, more technical terms. <laughs> so many people stop smoking cigarettes because they were seeing their own mothers and their fathers and their friends dying because of it. Yes. So, you know, when it really hit people in the face, you know, people started trying to do something about it. And now in airports, there's no smoking allowed. And in airplanes, there's no smoking allowed. In many restaurants, there's no... In the 50s and 60s, you never heard of such a thing where smoking wasn't allowed in anywhere, anything. It was welcome everywhere. So there's, there's actions being taken because it's just really hit us strong. So the environmental crisis is already hitting us strong. But most people are not really aware that it's affecting them because they're just so much... not feeling it so direct. 
and scientists and politicians, when they do feel it, they're not willing to be honest enough to tell them that this, this really could be the reason. Huh? So it may take things getting much worse until we're practically on the edge of falling <laughs> in a big way before we really take it seriously. That's unfortunate. But even when that happens, people have to see, if that happens that way, people have to see that there are developed technologies that are alternatives. Otherwise, there's no place for them to go. So whether it comes to that, either way, um, those people who are do have an awareness in whatever little sparrow-like ways, because it's an ocean, that situation with the cell phones and the, what do you call those TVs, high-definition TVs and all of that, it's, it's like trying to dry up an ocean. <laughs> and we're all sparrows, but we can do what we can to show alternatives. And ultimately the alternative is to teach people that real happiness is not by the quantity of what you consume. Real happiness is the very nature of the soul. When you find it within you, then everything you do is to express your happiness. And if you don't find it within you, no matter how much you take in to fill that void, you'll never really find it. It's like putting fuel in fire. The more you put, the more the fire burns. Does that answer your question? Yes. Finding your like inner soul. A few things. To associate with people who really are interested in that subject. Because our company very much opens doors to possibilities. It's like Alcoholics Anonymous, when they're with people who are in recovery, it gives them the strength to actually persevere their ideals. So in spiritual, you know, when we, when we keep company of people who really want that or really have that, that gives us direction and it gives us strength. And second is to have a spiritual practice every day. The company, the, the association of saintly people or like-minded people on a regular basis, um, gives us the strength, the clarity of vision, and to, to actually apply our life in the way we really want to go. But then we have to actually have some way to apply it. And to live with high character, to live by the values that we really believe, and to put time aside for our spiritual practice to actually make that connection. In our tradition, we chant God's names. We have these mantras. Man means the mind, and tra means to liberate it from all these anxieties and unnecessary distractions. There's no shortage of those. To actually find the inner fulfillment that's within us, to tune in to that power of grace that's within us and all around us. So we chant this mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Because in our tradition of the Vedas, the Vedas are a vast body of spiritual literatures originating in India that deal with astrology and astronomy and, and social um, strategic planning and philosophy and medicine and agriculture, it deals with every subject practically. 
and also, but it's all based on a foundation of spiritual enlightenment. And there were many mantras given. And of all the mantras, there's one Maha Mantra, which I just stated, this Hare Krishna Mantra. It's said to include all other mantras. And it actually cleans the heart and, and cle frees the mind of, of selfishness and envy and anger and greed and illusion and awakens our inner potential. That's the purpose of all true forms of meditation. It's the purpose of our puja or whatever rituals we may perform it should actually be a meditation. It's actually reconnecting us with ourselves. But we particularly, especially um, focus on this mantra. It's a meditation. It reconnects us to our own essence, which is the natural love of the soul for God and for all beings. Does that answer your question? Western medicine versus natural medicine and whether they can coexist peacefully. I was just curious. That's a main subject for me. I don't know how much time you have, but it would be wonderful to visit Bhaktivedanta Hospital. It's actually on the way back to Mumbai. We started a hospital. It's actually between here and Mumbai. It's just a few minutes off the main highway. Um, it's about 100 and, I think it's a 175 bed hospital. Um, it's basically the same values and principles that this eco-friendly village is based on is in the hospital. Obviously, and there's different, it's a whole different um, environment. <laughs> but the principles of human values and, and going to the roots of problems while we're dealing with other problems. So, as you have just said, medicine is a lot like religion. There's a lot of fundamental fanaticism. And in my own experience, there are allopathic doctors who say that Ayurvedic and naturopathy and acupuncture and all these other types of, they're all just hocus pocus and dangerous to humanity because they distract people from their form of medicine. And then if you talk to Ayurvedic and naturopathy and homeopathy people, they'll say allopathy is just destroying the world with all their nuclear drugs yes, and their chemicals. And then you talk to homeopathy and they say that, you know, Ayurveda, what is all these herbs and everything? This is what you have to do. And Ayurveda says, oh, homeopathy, what is that craziness? And naturopathy says they're all crazy and they're all cheating you and everybody's... It's just like religion. My way is the only way, right? <laughs> but, you know, we found that just like religion, all of them work. <laughs> In certain situations, some work better than others. Um, in certain emergency situations, allopathy will save a person's life, and homeopathy just you know if you if you have your hair your head cracked open in a car accident and somebody gives you these little round pills to take <laughs> you're gonna die <laughs> somebody gives you some herbs and, you know mixed with cow dung. <laughs> So oh, in our hospital, we have all the main um, branches of allopathy. We have 
pediatry, orthopedics, surgery, ophthalmology. We do cataract eye surgeries and a lot of things for the eyes. We have dialysis and for kidneys. And we have a whole department for liver, a whole department for cancer surgery, a whole department for giving birth to children. Um, we just, the ex-president of India, just earlier this last year actually, inaugurated our a new heart department where we could do open heart bypass surgeries. The machine to do that was donated to us. It costs almost as much as the entire hospital to build. <laughs> Donated though, so. but uh, <laughs> but we also have a whole branch for Ayurveda, where they do full panchakarma, as well as you know regular treatment in you know staying there at the hospital and outpatient. We have a whole branch for naturopathy. We have a we have homeopathy doctors there. We have acupuncturists and acupressurists. And all the doctors actually work together because they honor and respect each other's medicine. And they know that certain types of medicine actually have advantages over others for certain situations that people are suffering. I'll give you an example because you're so nice. <laughs> there was a, <laughs> there was a, I'm not going to mention names. There was a friend of mine who was a very famous tennis pro. He was like a champion tennis pro years ago. And playing tennis, he at one time, many, about 30 years ago, he punctured a lung. So in the last like 10 years, he was having these regular severe pains in his chest, severe pain. He'd be walking in a parking lot and he would just fall to his knees and couldn't breathe practically for, and he couldn't even get up for a half hour. And this was happening several times a year. And he's a, he's a relatively wealthy man and he's a motivational speaker. He travels all over the world. He's gone to top medical specialists in America top medical specialists in various countries of Europe, top medical specialists in Australia. He paid a fortune to see these people. He's gone to over 25 top specialists, and they all told him that this is because of the puncture in his lung. And they've all gave him therapies and medicine, but it kept happening. So I met him in America, and he said to me, I'm just so desperate. I have this puncture in my lung. And all these top doctors are giving me medicines and therapies and exercises and everything else. And I just keep getting these pains. But I heard in your hospital in Mumbai, you have an Ayurveda clinic. Could I come there and get Ayurvedic treatment for my lung? Because nothing's working with allopathy. So I said, sure, come. So he came. The Ayurvedic doctor takes his pulse. He said, it's not your lungs, it's your heart. So they did, uh, what is it, angiogram? Is that what it's called? Where they look in your heart? Four of his arteries were totally blocked. And then the heart specialist from our doctor looked at it, you know, because he, he actually did the angiogram and everything and looked at it and said, you've been having heart attacks for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's a miracle you're alive. So they called the top heart specialist in all of India. Usually you need a three-year waiting list. Dr. Bhattacharya, he, he's the one who does surgeries for prime ministers and everything. And he came and he said, this man should be dead. He said, he could die at any second. He should have a bypass surgery within three days. So he did it. 
very complicated. And now he's fine. Hasn't had any problems in his chest since. So it was an Ayurvedic doctor who discovered it. <laughs> what? That evolved. So their diagnosis, you know, is, can find certain things. And, you know, a lot of, in our, we have cataract surgeries in, in villages. And this one lady who's here, Kishori, and some other people come from America, they're acupuncturists. They, and they go and they do acupuncture for the patients after they get their you know, cataracts removed and everything. And it relieves almost all their pain, acupuncture, in such a better way than pain relievers. And certain chronic diseases, you know, allopathy really doesn't have much that they can do. But naturopathy, homeopathy, Ayurveda, they all have ways of actually sustaining good health and actually dealing with chronic diseases, you know, where the root of causes. So if all the doctors work together of all these different branches, incredible things can be done. That's kind of a uniqueness of our hospitals. We have all these branches working together as friends and brothers and sisters under the same roof with respect for each other's um, skills and what they represent. And also, we have a very wonderful spiritual theme that works hand in hand with all of them. With, with about a third of our patients are Muslims and Christians. And we teach people, whether they're Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Jains, Sikhs, Parsis, Jews, Buddhists. We have all kinds of patients. It's the way India is. Buddhism began in India. Jainism began in India. Hinduism began in India. Sikhism began in India. India is the second largest Islamic nation in the world. One of the oldest Jewish communities in the planet is in India. Jews have been here 2,000 years, practically before they even went to Europe. <laughs> and St. Thomas, one of the apostles of Jesus, in the generation after Jesus came and spread Christianity in India. And the largest Parsi or Zoroastrian population in the world is in India, because when, when, when Iran was conquered and everybody had to convert, most of the Parsis came as refugees to India. And the Dalai Lama of Tibet, when he escaped China, he set up his world headquarters in India. So India is quite. Um, variegated when it comes to spirituality. <laughs> but we have all, all these different kinds of people come to the hospital. We give them all spiritual care That's, that applies to them in there because there's universal values that we teach. And that really helps people to heal because people really develop a higher understanding of a purpose in life, of fulfillment in life, values in life that are not only um, wonderful for their own internal perspective, perceptions of the world, but it really helps people heal physically too. Because the mind seriously affects the body. Does that answer your question? I don't even remember your question. <laughs> But there's a special lady coming. I wish I could tell you the whole story, but now I have to go. But her name is Sindutai Samkal. If you'd like, you can join us. Join the other group that's here, and she'll be speaking to all of us. Have you heard of her? I gave lecture. You heard of the mother of the orphans? She's coming here. Just If you'd like everybody to meet her. She's one of the most extraordinary women on the planet. 
she may tell her story. But it's a story of unbelievable hope. Mm -hmm. She was never hardly allowed to go to school because she's from a simple little village and she had to herd buffaloes when she was four years old. When she was nine years old, she was forced to marry a man that was 35. By the time she was 19, she had two sons and was pregnant with a daughter. And she was, and she, she reported a criminal's activities to the police and the criminal influenced her husband to kill her by saying that the child within her womb was not the husband's but was the criminal's, which was a total lie. So the husband kicked her in the womb repeatedly for the purpose of killing her and the child. And she was unconscious and he dragged her to a cow shed, threw her under the cows with the idea that when people find her, they'll just think that the cow has stepped on her. And as you know, she kicked her so many times. She was, well, she was dead. And a cow stood over her for hours and hours and hours, protecting any other cow to, to, to touch her. Because, you know, they just walk and they could step on her. She's just laying there unconscious. And when she woke up, she found this cow standing right over her. And the cows, and she saw every time other cows were coming, other cows pushing them all around, protecting this lady. And the in-laws came to make sure she was dead. And the cow chased them away and stood over her. And she gave birth to a little girl under that cow. With a rock, she cut her umbilical cord. She went to her biological home, they wouldn't take her because of some archaic tradition that once a girl goes to her husband's house, she can't come back to her own house. So she was homeless with a little baby and totally beaten up, tragically beaten up. She was living at, cremata at crematoriums it's the only place men wouldn't like rape her or abuse her. She was cooking her wheat on top of burning human corpses. It's a long story. But finally, she just was so miserable, she decided to commit suicide. Even though she knew that she, when she, because that cow saved her life, she embraced the cow and promised the cow, as you saved me when I was helpless, I'm going to save people who are helpless. But her life was so miserable, she took her little baby and laid on a railway track. To, to kill both of them, because it was just too unbearable. She heard somebody screaming in pain while she was laying there and the train was coming. And she just got up to help that person. And it was a person who was, you know, really old and starving and thirsty. And she went and begged for some food and got some water. And he was so grateful. And she was thinking that God has given me, through this old man, he's given me an understanding that I have a purpose I can serve. There's a reason for me to continue living. She remembered her promise to the cow. But what is she going to do? She was sitting under a tree in a field. I'm so beaten and so abused and so forsaken. What am I going to do? And she noticed a tree that she was under. There was a, a woodsman that with an axe cut a branch really harshly. It was just all these gashes and gashes and gashes. And the branch was just hanging from one thread. Just hanging. But it was giving her and her child shade from the sun. So she said, this is God's answer. No matter how much I'm abused, I could still help others. And she started going around and picking up little kids like her, 
you know, she was 19 at the time, but kid, 10 years old, eight years old, who were orphans, forsaken, the children that uh, society pretends don't exist. And she became their mother. And if she had so many children, she would just, homeless, just, she would get food for them by singing. She would beg and beg by singing songs, and people would give something, and she'd cook. And gradually, somebody gave her a little house. And after some time, she became the mother of orphans. She's had about 1,500 children. Over 1,000 grandchildren. 275 sons-in-laws, I think, and 57 daughter-in-laws. She's gotten about 700 awards, national and international awards, for taking care of children. But she told the greatest fulfilling thing she ever did now she's 64 years old she started the orphanages when she was 19 just you know just orphanages under trees just picking up children that were homeless <clears throat> she um after she was very established and she was getting awards and everything this old man in, in his 80s came up to her in rags and was totally desperate. He was sick, he was starving, he was homeless. He was begging for her help. And she talked to him for a while and after she recognized that was her husband. They're the one that brutally tried to murder her. She said, I'm nobody's wife anymore. I'm only a mother. I'll be your mother. I forgive you. She took him in. Told all the other orphan children, give him a lot of love because he needs it the most. When people come to um, visit the orphanage, she would introduce him and say, this is my oldest child. She's like, you know, he's in his 80s at that time. I think she was in her 50s when he came. And um, he said, this is my oldest child. And he's been very naughty. <laughs> <laughs> She's an extraordinary lady. But she came to, I met her for the first time. She read the journey home and she called me. And then... No, what happened is she read the journey home and really liked it in the Marathi language. And then somebody came to her. You heard me speak this at Narayan's house? That lecture was on YouTube and somebody showed it to her that there's a Swami talking about you in America. And she watched it. And she said, I just read the book by the same Swami. So she called me. And she said she wanted to meet me. So just a couple weeks ago, she came to see me. And it was so beautiful. And um, she, we talked for about a half hour. And she came with two others, like in their late 30s, early 40s. And after we spoke for about a half hour, she told me that this lady here, that's my daughter who was born under the cow. She's a doctor now. <laughs> and one of her sons, who she had with this man, they, when she started the orphanage, they left their father to live with her. And both of them have PhDs. And one did their PhD thesis on their mother's life. So I invited her to come here, knowing that all of you are going to be here, thinking it would be nice to meet her. So if you, want, if you can put it in your schedule, she'll be here from one to four. What time is it now?
So I don't want to take too much of your time because I'm just speaking all this theoretical stuff. <laughs> but these devotees will actually try to give you an understanding of and the vision of whatever practical seva or services we're trying to do. But Professor, I'm so grateful. I know her by a different name than you do, but what name do they know you by? P professor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful that you will come and I hope you have a wonderful experience. And if it's possible, you may want to just have a little tour of the hospital and talk to those people. I think if there's a lot of medical and science people here, it could be very interesting. We could arrange, you know, some of the leaders to take in a little tour, even if it's for an hour or two, whatever time you have. You may consider that. So wonderful. <laughs> I wish I could just join your tour. <laughs> <laughs> I will put it on my wish list. <laughs> my honor. But we have to do it kind of quick because I have so many things to do. Thank you so very much. <laughs>